Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you, Miranda Janelle, That Charlie Dude, Justin Zellers, and Henry Kim. On this episode of DTNS, X-Reel points the way to the future of smart glasses, a way to tag birds without using tags, and Dr. Nikki explains how 3D modeling has given us the most info on woolly mammoths yet. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, July 16th, 2024. I'm Tom Merritt, and I am also in Los Angeles. I am Sarah Lane, and I am also in Los Angeles at Studio Animal House. From an undisclosed location in the desert, I'm Dr. Nikki Ackermans. And I'm here where I always am. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. So intriguing, Dr. Nikki. Can you say which desert or no? Uh, it, it is one that has one of four corners, I would say. <laughs> oh, I know which one now. Ah, yes. Sand. Classic yes. four-cornered. Uh, low on water, I'm sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. High oh. temperatures. Yep. We're getting close. Somewhat. We're getting closer. <laughs> Scrub brush. I Indeed. know the one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you for for joining us. I'm glad you get internet out there. It's not an internet desert that you're in. We'll just see. A, <laughs> hopefully. It looks good for now. Yeah, so far so good. Let's not jinx it. Let's start with the quick hits. You no longer have to sign up for a developer account if you'd like to try the beta of iOS 18 ahead of its official release later this autumn. If you install the beta, you get RCS support, the ability to put icons anywhere on the home screen, a more customizable control center, the ability to swap out the camera and flashlight shortcuts on the lock screen, if you so desire, and others. Apple Intelligence, not yet in the beta, but the company does say it should arrive to try in beta later this autumn and for all users in 2025. To try the beta... Go to Settings, General, Software Update, and select the iOS 18 public beta from the dropdown. Sorry, I almost cut off the ability to go do that. So, yeah, go do that. A hacktivist group has posted what it claims to be data from thousands of Disney's internal Slack channels. The data contains dates for unreleased projects, uh, a lot of code, uh, a lot of other group communications, stuff Disney might not necessarily want everyone to be able to read. The data appears to reach back to 2019. The group that posted the data says it wants to raise awareness about how Disney handles artist contracts and its policies on AI. Now, the data may have some stuff about that in there, but that's not what it's limited to. Uh, the group says the compromise that they compromised the account of a Disney manager of software development. That's how they were able to get into Slack. They also are not asking for money. So this is not a ransomware attack. Microsoft is introducing Checkpoint cumulative updates for Windows Server 2025 and Windows 11 version 24H2 and also later. That's less this. <laughs> this lets Microsoft deliver security updates and features in smaller packages. So in other words, just the part that changed, not reinstalling the whole chunk of code. That means smaller amounts of data coming through the pipes, smaller space needed to stage the upgrade files on the hard drive, and less time installing the update each month. If you want to see how it works before it does roll out to everyone later this year, you can get Insider Preview Build 26120.1252. A nonprofit academic group called Eleuther AI, that's E L E U T H E R A I, included data scraped from public YouTube videos in its pile data set, which was made available to any organization researching AI. It was an open data set. However, Proof News alleges that Eleuther AI didn't have permission and therefore broke YouTube's terms of service when it scraped that data. Thousands of organizations used the pile data set in training of various models. Uh, And of course, that's going to make a good headline if you say Apple used YouTube data without permission or NVIDIA used YouTube data without permission or Anthropic used YouTube data or Salesforce. You get the idea. Uh, We should be clear that neither Apple, NVIDIA, Salesforce or Anthropic scraped the data themselves. They were using this open data set in good faith uh, that was provided as an academic source of information uh, and that the people creating the data set are the ones who may have improperly accessed training data. 
Marco Arment has released a new version of his Overcast podcast app, rebuilt from scratch. Most users won't notice much of a difference, though a few features are missing, including Siri shortcuts support, storage management, and OPML exporting and importing. This should come soon. Streaming a podcast episode won't be supported at all, though. Uh, all podcasts must be downloaded before playing. Arment uh, made his case um, in the new update saying this is just a better experience for the end user. Overall, the app should be faster and easier to use with a couple new features like an undo button if you happen to accidentally jump to the wrong part of an episode, for example. Raise your hand if you're using Overcast right now. Everyone in the audience, I see you. Yes, congrats. I hope you're enjoying the new app. R.W. Nash, I see you. All right, it looks like smart glasses are doing better than headsets in the amorphous world of augmented reality. The chief executive of glasses maker Essilor Luxottica said Tuesday that the new Ray-Ban Meta smart glasses, which have had universally good reviews, have sold more in a couple of months than the first generation did over two years. Uh, another standout in smart glasses is X-Real, which is trying a different spin on the form factor with the X-Real Beam Pro. Now, we mentioned this when they announced it. Uh, the reviews are in, though, now. Uh, if you don't remember, the Beam Pro is $199, and it's an Android-powered device the size of a smartphone, so it has a touchscreen and everything, but it's not a smartphone. So you don't have LTE, 5G, data connection. You're intended to use it specifically with the $299 X-Real glasses. So put these together, and it costs $500 for the whole package. The reviews are out on whether that's worth it. Because the idea is you can control the display on your X-Real glasses from that $199 device. You can run apps on it. You can run apps side by side. They have some customized layers, etc. David Pierce at The Verge wrote, X-Real has the beginning of something really clever here, but I'll probably wait for the next one. So they're saying, look, this is... A good idea, but it's a little buggy, and it's probably not worth the price yet. Uh, it does give you 1080p 3D video, 50 megapixel 3D photos that you can play back in your glasses. Uh, so that's something you wouldn't get from a phone. You've got some customized software in there. There's a second USB-C port, another thing you wouldn't have on a phone. Uh, that way you can charge the Beam Pro while you're connected to the glasses. And Beam Pro screen works as a remote control when it's plugged in. Theoretically, you could do that with extra software, but it's built into the operating system, so it works a little smoother. Uh, this is not so much, to me, the product that you need to run out and get, but I like what David Pierce is saying, that there's something really clever here. And that, with the uh, increased sales of, of the Meta uh, glasses, which, which again, are, are generally well-reviewed, make me think that rather than headsets the growth area for augmented reality is more lower level glasses, something that you're going to throw on your head anyway. Well, and connected to some type of computer, in this case, right. you know, the, the Android device that isn't a phone, but is uh, lots of other things. You know, what, what strikes me as, uh, and uh, The Verge, David Pierce at The Verge wrote this up really nicely, What what's still clunky about this is... We've all got, you know, a phone. Uh, you know, not everybody has a smartphone, but many of us have smartphones. And they do so many things. So to have another device that's more or less the size of a smartphone that would be paired to the glasses in this case um, is, is fine, uh, especially if you're doing photography stuff. That seemed like one of the standouts. Uh, but also, yeah, it, 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 sort of a stopgap measure to, like, wh where... How does this become something that you just plug your smartphone into? Yeah, I think this is an interesting use case. You know, I, I didn't think about it, but I would much prefer to have glasses than a headset for 3D, even if that means a bit of a downgrade. Um, I'm sure eventually they'll get it to work with a smartphone. And, and like this reporter said, it's kind of the, the missing step in between right now. So this is maybe more of a developer type project. I don't know. Um, I'm thinking of cases where I, as someone who doesn't have glasses, would want smart glasses. I think anything where I don't want to be using a phone. So uh, navigation for example would be something where I'd be really into having that or any kinds of sports um, so I think this this is going to continue 
And I think there's a market for it, but they may need to just make it so that it connects to your smartphone. That's the next logical step. Well, and, and there are glasses that connect to your smartphone, but they can't do all the things that the Beam Pro can enable, right? That, sure. That's that's the trick is like, well, when you've got a smartphone running a whole smartphone thing, you can't customize the OS, uh, so it can't be right. quite as capable. But then Pierce is saying, well, but the Beam Pro is a little bit buggy. So if you really want that to be an advantage, you got to work out those bugs, which they could. I do think that glasses that wirelessly connect to a thing you already have is way more compelling, though. Uh, yeah. So figuring that out or making this small enough that you can use your smartphone to be the touchscreen control, but maybe there's a second device that's in the glasses that can provide some of the Beam Pro stuff. I don't know. Uh, feels like there's something there, but this definitely has the hallmarks of the growing sector of the market and we mm -hmm. haven't seen the final form yet but we're we're seeing the the coloring in around the edges so to speak yeah we're closing in on it slowly yeah 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 now a lot of folks out here say ai is for the birds sarah explain why that is <laughs> well this morning i woke up to uh, a uh, a murder of crows uh outside my window we've got we've got some neighborhood crows they're just squawky as all heck but they're kind of lovable as well Aww, i wish yeah. i knew more about <laughs> them um, and for people like me, uh, something called the Bird Buddy Smart Bird Feeder uh, is uh, able to identify the species of a visiting bird and is getting some new features as part of a new nature intelligence update. So, for example, it could send you notifications when an individual bird stops by. Name that bird is what it's called. It's a non-invasive form of bird tagging. So, I mean, this is would be, uh, you know, bird tagging in in historically has been you know you put something around the bird's ankle and you know be able to know which bird is which type thing bird buddy uses images captured by the smart feeders five megapixel camera and image recognition they say it's ai that can spot differences between birds to track those individual birds without using something like a tag although the birds have to physically land on the feeder to be identified so it is kind of specific but uh, it's kind of cool. Bird Buddy goes for $239. The new features require the Bird Buddy Pro subscription service, which starts at $6 per month. So this is very much a hobbyist uh, a technology item. Uh, if you don't care about birds, or you, or you just, you know, don't need to make friends with, you know, which crow is hanging out on my doorstep at which time, maybe not the right product for you. But Nikki, since you're with us here today, and I know that you, you do care about birds and the <laughs> idea of being able to track their behavior, sickness, all sorts of stuff, this seems like a kind of compelling product. It's kind of compelling. I'm reticent to know whether it does what it actually says it does. So I talked to a friend who has the normal bird buddy and she said it's good at identifying big birds, not so much with small birds because of the distance from the camera. They actually had to 3D print a little extender so that they could stand a little bit further from the camera to ID that. If it can ID species, I don't know how it's going to be able to ID individual animals. Um, and I guess they don't really disclose how they do that. And I'm also curious as to, I'm sure there are scientists who are doing individual animal identification with AI, but it's not that widespread. And so I don't know how this company has a really good AI for that and it's not used in the research community. So I'm a little mm -hmm. bit skeptical. I still think it's a fun gadget. Um, and and it, you do have in here that it could do other animal identification. I could see this expanding into a trail cam also for like hunting or for whoever, those are people have trail cams in their backyards. That could be cool too. Um, a lot of people misidentify like coyotes with wolves. So this could be a good one for that. I don't oh, know. Oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like this technology, obviously it's marketed towards bird enthusiasts, but yes, uh, Bird Buddy says that it's working on being able to identify butterflies, different kinds of bees or lizards or raccoons or squirrels, or, you know, even, you know, knowing if a cat or a dog is coming around that bird feeder too often type thing, mm -hmm. maybe it should be put in a different location. So, so yeah, I mean, as somebody who's like, hmm, I don't really have a backyard, but like I could kind of put this in my front yard. There's certainly a lot of birds in my neighborhood. It would, be, it would be a fun experiment, if nothing else. Yeah, the, the models out there are good enough to do this. 
a five megapixel camera may not be good enough to get the level of detail mm -hmm. needed. Uh, yeah. Or maybe the software upgrade for Name That Bird uh, improves the ability to extract patterns out of that five megapixel camera. But I, I'm with you, Nikki. If this is is good enough, if, this is maybe good enough for home use, but if it's really good, wouldn't it have more widespread use? And maybe it does and we're just not aware of it. I don't know. Yeah, I think they're targeting really the middle of the field for bird people. You've got people who don't care about birds at all. This is not for them. You've got people who are really into birds and they're probably better at identifying them than the bird buddy is. And then you've got people who are like, I don't know, this seems cool. And I think that's the target. That being said, it's neat. Like it'll capture things that you, when you're not looking at your bird feeder that you wouldn't know are there. Um, I think it has value. I think it's still gimmicky. And I hope that we I'm interested in seeing future implements of this. I know they have a hummingbird feeder also that's coming out. That's pretty neat. Um, that kind of limits your species though, but I want to see more animal hobby AI tech things and I want to test them out for DTNS. <laughs> <laughs> Message received. Live uh, with it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Clinton <laughs> says uh, he thinks they're just faking it. Who would know? Um, I would know. <laughs> I was going to say, I think a lot of birders do know individual birds. And so they would yeah, be able to tell. I, I want to see their list of parameters of how they define individual birds because it's really hard. So I don't know how they're doing it. Like, I don't think we know how to do it. I don't well, know. computer well, and, vision and again, algorithms are really good at identifying individual people. Like you can do that on your iPhone now. Yeah. So a more sophisticated algorithm theoretically could do it. You also don't have the bird's consent to this. though. I want the mm -hmm. research paper that says what part of the yeah. bird's face they're using to identify it. Because I don't think we know what that is. So how do they know? That's not the way the algorithms work usually, though. Oh, they, okay. We okay. don't know what the algorithms do, right? The algorithms just oh. start training themselves to figure out like, oh, I can tell this one is the same one. And if it's right, we go, oh, the, the algorithm figured it out. But we may not know what part of the face it's using or what part of the bird it's using. Yeah, yeah that's facial recognition. I mean, I, I am not, I would not consider myself a, 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 a hardcore birder, but I, I love birds. And I have noticed uh, patterns of birds, especially as the seasons have changed in my house that I've lived in for not mm -hmm. even a year now. And, you know, the crows are crazy these days, but we've got some minor birds um, uh, hanging out around uh, plenty of um, uh, plenty of hummingbirds, which hummingbirds are kind of their own thing. But, uh, yeah, I would I would sort of like to know more about that. Maybe there's some wild parrots in my neighborhood. Let's find out. It's Why not? What am I going to do with that information? Nothing, me specifically. <laughs> but if I were Nikki, maybe that would be something that, you know, could be just part of a scientific effort. Yeah. Agreed. Or sometimes I'd, it's just I'd fun like to that. know. Yeah. yeah. Both, both. Well, uh, Apple users, uh, you span far and wide. I'm with you, people. If you love all things Apple, then I've got the podcast for you. Every week on Apple Vision Show, Eileen Rivera and I walk through all things Apple. The good, the bad, what we want to see in the future. Do check it out, and please subscribe. AppleVisionShow.com. 50 scientists from around the world worked together to recreate a three-dimensional representation of a woolly mammoth's genetic code and published their results in the journal Cell on Thursday. Unlike previous finds where the animal's DNA was broken down with a bunch of scrambled pieces, the scientists found a more complete set of code due to the way a 52,000-year-old woolly mammoth carcass was preserved uh, Nikki, tell us about this. What 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 do we find out from this more complete set of DNA that we couldn't find out before? Well, uh, as you know, anytime there's a DNA, ancient DNA story, I jump on it for DTNS because yeah. this is one of my favorite hobby topics. So, all right, I'll break I'll break this down. I'll break down your genetic code, Tom. Thank uh, you. Normally, <laughs> ancient DNA is really fragmented. When you find it, that's just because it degrades over time. And so it's only really able to provide a short piece of genetic code that we could then map onto the equivalent of a modern reference genome. So here, maybe like a modern elephant, for example example. And then we would be able to identify genetic variation between the two pieces, but we only have these small fragments. 
But this method would then overlook large scale differences that would be hiding between the missing fragments. So we don't know the big differences between a mammoth and an elephant because we're missing pieces. So like with the woolly mammoth, we have the equivalent of like a book chapter, but we don't know what page number it belongs to. Ah, uh, okay. That, that, that makes sense to me. So what did they do differently this time? So they actually customized this technique called in situ high C to examine the DNA. So um, as opposed to the traditional analysis, high C captures the structure of a chromosome, the C's for chromosome. So DNA strands are basically really tightly woven into really tight curls to make these chromosomes. And the the structure that they have does give you information on different ways that the genes are expressed pretty much. Uh Um, I'm sure geneticists can, can, you know, fix what I just said, but um, high C specifically measures the frequency at which the two DNA fragments associate within the 3D space. So it links the structure of the chromosome to the actual genetic, genetic and genomic sequence. And actually we learn way more about the genes this way. Um, not only about what the gene fragments, the DNA fragments are telling us, but because of the structure, we can learn about how the genes are regulated um, and how they change in the regulation and expression changes in response to stimuli. So like if it's colder, your hair grows thicker or a mammoth's hair would. Um, that's kind of what this information, this new information we got gave us. And this technique is pretty recent. It's It's been used on human DNA only about 10 years ago. And actually, nobody thought it would work on mammoth tissue. Okay, so I, I, I sort of get that, like based, the DNA is folded differently based on what's happening. And so the way it's folded tells you a little bit about what was going on with the mammoth. Yeah. But why was this DNA so much easier to read? Why? What, what was so better preserved about it? Well, first of all, they hadn't thought to try it, <laughs> but uh, when they did, they realized that this tissue was particularly well conserved. It basically was naturally freeze dried. Uh, they found it in the Siberian tundra in 2018, and it's basically beef jerky. I'm not even joking. It's <laughs> it's mammoth jerky. Oh, um, no. And w- <laughs> I don't know how it tastes, but what happened with <laughs> the extreme cold and dryness of the tundra, it basically freeze dried this tissue and it locks the DNA into a glass like state that's called called chromoglass, which is a cool name. And it's actually really good at preserving a chromosome's 3D structure. And the the best part for me about this paper is that the team tried to recreate this, this natural process. So in the lab, they had some unconventional experiments. Um, they created an experimental beef jerky in the lab, and then they tried to damage it to degrade the DNA to see how well it would, it would hold up. So they ran it over with a car, uh, they shot it, they hit it with a fastball, and they microwaved it. Uh, and they made a music video about all of that. And I just love <laughs> nerds and it's amazing. So you should watch it. Uh, and, and after all this, the DNA was really resistant. So they were able to recreate this mammoth jerky uh, in the lab. Okay, so they were using beef jerky just to yeah. to, to kind of be able to run over things with a car that they, they wouldn't want to do with their only mammoth jerky uh, sample. Exactly. And they Makes wanted sense. to make sure that was the right preservation technique. All right. So what did we end up learning out of all of this? We actually learned as the most that we've ever learned about, about mammoth genetics, which is awesome. Because of this free dried tissue, uh, the the first time ever, it it became the first time ever that researchers could count the number of chromosomes in the mammoth cells. So they found out that mammoths have 28 chromosomes, just like elephants. Uh, So that's pretty cool. Although there are some similarities and differences. Um, For example, uh, this is a skin piece that they had. So about 4% of the skin genes didn't match elephant tissues. And one of the ones in particular that didn't match is a gene that regulates hair growth. And it's Hmm. inactive in mammoths, which means that they have more hair growth, probably. And so this gene is probably the key to their wooliness. Look at that. So, uh, Sarah, are you thinking what I'm thinking? What are you thinking? Let's clone some mammoths. (laughs) I, I mean, wah, wah, the, the wah, woolly mammoth wah. and the saber-toothed tiger are, you know, the two where I'm like, why don't, maybe, why? Why not? Let's let's bring them back. Uh, that, that's I, I that's the you. thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> is, is that everybody, there, there's even that group out of, what, is it Australia that, that always talks about their project to clone mammoths? Um, I thought they were American, but I could be Maybe mistaken. there's Americans in there too, but does this actually get us closer to that? 
closer. Uh, we're not there yet. It's it's very complicated, especially for a large animal, uh, considering that you would have to have the elephants give birth to mammoths, and we already are not very good at having elephants give birth. But mm. we are much closer to having a complete mammoth genome before the idea was just to use the fragments and make a kind of a elephanty mammothy hybrid. And we don't have to do that anymore because we have at least the skin part of the genome, and with more samples, we'll probably maybe get the complete genome pretty soon and this is not something that anyone expected to work anytime soon so this is a huge step forward um and i believe the company you were talking about was colossal biosciences yes i personally one, right? am not convinced by their uh, sayings that they're going to clone the mammoth and the dodo but this is really exciting um and, and in terms of future applications we're going to understand a lot more about other extinct species if we can get some our hands on some of the mummies which we do have um and also in terms of modern you know science we can maybe understand genetically how animal how fast animals can adapt to climate change and um maybe use those applications with modern day endangered species. So lots of cool stuff coming out of this paper. So mummified extinct species does not sound frightening at all to most people, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, New and horror film when? <laughs> they they would have to have died in fr freezing conditions for this yeah, to be they have to be specifically right. freeze dried. <laughs> yeah. But it's uh, not out of the Freeze dried to lock in freshness. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably like the a woolly, woolly rhino mammoth, out that there. would be what you know in many cases they would have died in, right? I I expect that there are more use cases. I don't know how many because it seems very particular, but I know that there's a dinosaur foot mammoth um mammoth mummy somewhere mm. and I'm like please 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 let's test that next. I Let's try it. I don't yeah, think yeah. it's doable, but I'm I'm excited. I'm like what a ha, hmm. kind of for it, kind of against it. I'm not sure. It would not work for actual mummified animals, right? Like No, mummies. it does. You, you can't you can't we, bring back the mummified animal. No, no, no. I'm you just saying like can this get is their freeze genome. Like like ones in Egypt that weren't freeze dried. So right. you'd be surprised the actual really? other test that they did on this the the person got a like um roadkill like mummified mouse that they found on the side ah, of the road to okay. work a piece of their leather bag um they tried so on it doesn't all have kinds to be like, freeze-dried per se no but that was for such an old specimen that was a one mm -hmm. way to preserve the dna for maybe a more modern specimen it might be okay yeah so huh. pretty neat very very cool i, I yeah. assume we could do this on actual mummies oh yeah it's been done people. i mean it's been yeah. done on more modern people yeah yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, well, no mammoths coming yet, uh, but you do get glasses you can plug into your phone. So, you know, uh, it's a trade. We're halfway there. It's a yeah, trade. Exactly. Yeah. You can Let's get a check VR out. mammoth. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can see a mammoth, just won't be real. Uh, let's check out the mail. Later. If you are getting ready for your next holiday adventure, and if so, congrats. <laughs> Chris Christensen has some important advice on getting your personal technology also ready. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. This one is more of a nudge or a nag. You should back up your computer, you should eat your vegetables and floss, and you should also set your emergency contact in your mobile phone. I recently lost my iWatch when it fell off my wrist at Crash Boat Bay in Puerto Rico after jumping in the water from a jet ski or a jet boat. But... Some good Samaritan found it while snorkeling a few minutes later, looked at the emergency contact which had been copied to my watch from my phone, and a few hours later, I had my iWatch back. Hmm. It's a lesson that there are good people in the world and that you should always set your emergency contact. Oh, yeah, and that you should probably not wear your iWatch while you do jet skiing. <laughs> this is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Uh, don't eat your vegetables while jet skiing either. That's <laughs> yeah. It's just it, it's it's too much at once. You know what if you take a big bite of a zucchini and choke? You know. No yeah. wonder your Apple Watch goes don't. flying. <laughs> don't eat uh, your well, Apple Watch. <laughs> don't eat your mammoth jerky while your Apple if Watch is jet skiing. If you're a woolly mammoth, don't go jet skiing. Okay, it's just not <laughs> there right we go. for you. Yeah. Uh, come full circle. Uh, Dr. Nikki Ackermans, thank you so much for being with us today. Let folks know where to keep up with your latest. 
very simple. Everything about me and my work is at NicoleAckermans.com. We've got updates recently from the lab. A new paper about dinosaur headbutting just came out where I was co-author. So you can find all of that right there. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We might talk a little bit more about mammoths, uh, but also Probably. Amazon Prime Day is here. And I think it's silly, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> we'll debate how wrong I am. <laughs> stick around. You can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow with Scott Johnson joining us. And we'll talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>